Thank you for this. It's really nice to see comparisons between Latin America and Africa. It's awesome. Uh, and I have like a small question for Simon. Have you perhaps considered doing the same analysis for South Africa? Uh, because then like the whole labor RTI could be really interesting to see. Thanks. And the second one, if I can take advantage of the mic, have you tried to, con to see whether the nature of growth or the way in which the economy moves is, is driving this process of, of polarization in, in the labor market? Thanks. Thanks very much for all the presentations. It was very interesting to see this uh, comparison. So I was, I'm sorry, Simone, I don't have much to say about Ghana, um, but I was intrigued by the, by the references to the minimum wages um, for both uh, Brazil and, and, and Argentina. And I understand, Sergio, you, this is not part of your analysis, but you were referring to other things. And I was in particular wondering whether these, how, how binding is the minimum wage in these countries and, and how binding was it to start with? Um, so, so you were making an, a reference to the fact that uh, the minimum wage rose in real terms and at the same time we saw falling, uh, form, uh, sorry, increasing formalization um, and, and, and a kind of more pro poor um, kind of growth. Um, if I think from the standpoint of Colombia, 50% of people earn below the minimum wage and so the minimum wage is by no way pro poor. It sort of benefits the more the middle classes. So, uh, so I was wondering a little bit how, how that's, uh, the minimum wage fit the overall story and the pro poor uh, part of the conclusions. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Um, actually, there's a study on South Africa that was done by Harun Borat together with Amy. And I think something interesting that they were looking at, like they disaggregated the, the patterns by gender and they found quite different patterns depending on whether you were looking at male or female workers. So in South Africa, you had this phenomenon that female workers largely stayed in this domestic service occupations. And there you saw kind of a move towards this low skill routine um, manual work that was still dominant there and then you had a more polarizing pattern among the male labor force but yeah, the the working paper is on the wider website if you're you're interested in that one and regarding the process of growth i think what we have been looking at in a way is this kind of lack of growth in the manufacturing sector or this kind of absence of industrialization patterns and this move of workers towards informal service sector jobs and something that we have been uh, struggling with to some extent is deciding on are those routine jobs or non-routine jobs that are done in the informal sector basically because on the one hand it's very ad hoc so it's very non-routine in a way but probably it's jobs that you could get rid of often or that could be automized in a in a way, kind of, and I think this is something that we have been doing some extra coding on also to try to, to get those right, yeah. Okay, so uh, <clears throat> about minimum wage and uh, inequality, so yes, you are right, we did not do this uh, here, uh, but I've done that in a previous paper with Chico Ferreira and Julian Messina, and there are many other papers looking at that. So in our paper, uh, that this other one, what we do, is look at two sub-periods from 94 to 2002 and 2002 to 2012, okay? And what we see is that <coughs> wage inequality or earnings inequality was declining even in this, uh, during the 90s, but not as uh, sharply as in the 2000s. And there was a real increase in minimum wage at that time that produced uh, unemployment and increase in inequality in that period. But during the 2000s, when you had uh, 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 income growth in that period, what we saw is that we had a uh, uh, <coughs> minimum, real minimum wage increase. So basically, uh, it more than doubled uh, in real terms. And when you look at the wage distribution, it's funny to see that it becomes very concentrated around minimum wage. So when you say that half of the population in Colombia <coughs> workers are uh, making less than, than minimum wage, they're probably also somehow their earnings are related to minimum wage. They're earning probably, no? Okay. So that used to be the case in Brazil. No, no, yeah, but I mean, informality in Brazil is really high, but when you see minimum wage 
being binding is a trivial formal sector uh, in the known register with do or uh, labor without contract. Okay, so and there is this fairness argument, and also because of the uh, labor legislation, uh, even if you are an informal worker, uh, if you are work for a firm, right, uh, with no, uh, uh, but you are not registered, you can then sue the firm, uh, saying that look, I worked here, have proof, and uh, they did not pay me the minimum wage. So basically, all the firms, knowing that they pay when you have this uh, informal type job, uh, at least the minimum wage. So it's, it's amazing to see that uh, the proportion of people in the formal work, in the formal job, making exactly the minimum wage is higher than in the formal uh, sector. Uh, anyway, so uh, uh, in, in Brazil, I think that the growth in 2000s, which was explained by many factors, right, could also uh, explain why you had uh, a rise, uh, a raising in, in formality, right? Formality uh, grew in, in Brazil that period, and minimum wages, uh, raises that did not uh, unemployed uh, people during that time, or did not contribute to increasing inequality. Well, um, I don't know. Um, I, I first thing is, um, I think is that the question is about the proportion of workers under the minimum wage in, in Argentina, in the labor market of, of, of Argentina. I don't have uh, right now the, exactly the number, but uh, I can refer to the uh, an, an article. Um, um, the author was Mauricio Ambasquet, who um, analyzed the, the the role of minimum wage and the, inequ and the inequality in in Argentina during the. Um, I think they focus on the first period when the minimum wage became more more operative in in our labor market, and um, what they they say that it was an, an equalizing effect because uh, the, this this huge uh, increment in in Argentina more than two to 100%, and uh, it is a reference for the collective bargains uh, also, uh, and the collective bargains during those uh, period also cr increased um, more than, than 50%, I think from 2,000 uh, uh, per year uh, increase of, or, or I think more than 1,000 collective bargains in, in Argentina in 2008. This is a number I, I have, but the, in, the, in the paper I mentioned uh, by, by Mauricio and Masquez and back at they with I think they they try with a contrafactual um, distribution wage the effect of the minimum wage in Argentina and in the in the inequality and it was effective any other questions so I have some questions for you <laughs> uh, it's for all of you the, the two first and the third is for you so the first one is, um, I think you all find that uh, earning structure effects matter more than composition effects. So do you have any idea why is that result? And the same for polarization. When you find result, it's mainly for earnings and not for jobs. So do you also have any idea of why is that? Uh, and the third question for you, you find that formality has an effect at the first period, then it, the effect vanishes. So do you have any explanation or any hypothesis for this? Who wants to start? So can you repeat the first one? I didn't the take note. Is, uh, earnings and the composition effects, uh, earnings is higher, the effect is higher. Yeah, so the structure effect is higher, right? Yeah, uh, and I, I believe that has to do with the fact that many gaps have uh, have closed or have got uh, tighter during this period, at least in Brazil. So, I mean, many, not only the RTI, which is not very important, but other gaps, uh, as for example, the education uh, premium uh, decreased, the experience premium decreased, ratio and gender gaps also decreased. So overall, the structure effect, which is basically uh, fixing the, 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 the composition of the worker force, uh, fixed and look at, looking at a difference in pay, that explains most of uh, changes uh, in the wage structure. And, and your second question was? In the, um, when you have the polarization, uh -huh. there is no job polarization in general, but yeah. 
Yeah, and I think it has to do with the way that you, I mean, those two sub periods we see uh, some like a, a growth incidence curve, which is basically pro poor in the beginning and more pro rich in, in, in the second period. So when you combine those two, you get that could be explain. That would be my answer. Um, yeah, I think it's probably somewhat similar for for Ghana, and I think part of why the composition effect wasn't that strong is because also we didn't include agriculture in in the analysis basically and I think the main move in terms of the composition was really this move out of agriculture and then towards low skill informal jobs on the one hand and then this kind of more high skill formal job sector jobs on the other hand but as we couldn't get a good measure of earnings in agriculture which is really hard to do we basically had to to drop that segment and I think this is partly why we may not be seeing the, the full composition effect, essentially, for, for the case of Ghana. Okay, my turn. Um, what, what we find in the decomposition and the, 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 the principal driver of the movement in the Gini index was the earning um, structure effect. Uh, we think that in Argentina what happened that it's not enough the, in the, 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 the increase in, in employment to, to affect the, the, the distribution of the earning, only unless the, 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 the increment in employment changed the, 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 the returns of the occupation uh, where are increasing. So because of that, we think that the earning polarization was the principal uh, driver. And about the, the, the third second, I think the, the, the question in, uh, about the formalization process uh, stop it being an, an equalizing factor in reducing inequal, uh, inequalizing factor in Argentina. Uh, we think that uh, because after, after 2012, uh, the macroeconomic context in Argentina became very, very erratic uh, with um, crisis and, and inflation over 12% per year and, and the, even the, 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 the the international context, what, what was favorable in the first period, uh, stopped it being in, in the second period. So the formalization um, process stopped it, and we saw in the in one of the graph I, I show in the in the presentation. And because of that, the the formalization stopped it being this this kind of factor. I don't know if I answered the question. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, to the three of you. So if you don't have any questions, ah, Kunal, please. So the question is, this is the big picture question. So generally you find that the routine bias technological change make, not didn't make a big difference in explaining earnings movements, earnings equality movements. So the question I have is that, so if it's a horse race between skill bias technological change and routine bias technological change, it seems that skill bias technological change is winning the race in these countries, right? If you could, so it's just these two, horse, two horses that are running. Of course the other thing, minimum wages, social factors, other things are there. But why would that be the case that skill bicycle change seems to still dominate or uh, since routine bicycle change? Is it a measurement of the task intensity occupations? Though I know Simone has done great work trying to find new, pro new measures. Is it to do with the nature of, of automation not yet being so important in these countries? Is it to do with structural change that was asked here earlier? What exactly is it? Why are we seeing, as compared to the US, that the horse race is right now being won by skill bicycle change? Sorry. <laughs> Okay, maybe I can give it a shot and then the others can, can add. I think something that we have been seeing in the global paper um, is that even though, I mean, for all the countries we've been looking at here, we see this decline in RTI, which if you look at it for the individual country case, it looks like, okay, it's, it's declining. But if you look at it from a global perspective, we see that this decline has been way much flatter compared to the developed countries. So the gradient is not as steep. So we do see this move, but it's not yet as pronounced at least. And I think this is part of the, of the story in a way. Um, I think the other aspect is there's quite some change over time. Like if you remember the case of Ghana, for example, you have a decline in the education premium in both periods, right? Okay, it was a bit less pronounced in the second one, but basically this change was equalizing in both periods. And actually we did see a polarizing trend coming from the remuneration of RTI. So I think something to also keep in mind, of course, 
data isn't collected super frequently, so we don't have maybe the most up-to-date one, and I do think that this might change in the near future, kind of. And I think in a number of the countries, we have been seeing an increasing trend of RTI matter mattering more, and probably also technological change picking up more in those countries, and routinization or deroutinization picking up more in those countries. So I think even though it wasn't the main factor for the full period that we have been looking at, seeing it mattering more in the later period should still give us a bit of a warning that it might still have this kind of polarizing effect in the years to come. And I think something why we don't see it so much in the earlier years is also if you think of offshoring, like some of those countries, like if you look at the case study for Bangladesh or something, were actually countries that received the kind of routine type of job. So you had some increase in those occupations for some time, and the patterns are mainly now only, only shifting, kind of. And I think, think that's part of the reasons. Can I go first? <coughs> uh, no, so uh, I think that for Latin America, and, and particularly for Brazil, I mean, productivity, uh, labor productivity is pretty stagnant over the last decades. Uh, so, and there are many reasons <coughs> for that, like the region being not very exposed to, to trade. <coughs> uh, we are, in a way, protective to uh, small uh, firms which cannot afford to I mean, to increase technology or adopt new technologies. So in, in, in that sense, I mean, we don't see any big change in terms of technology that could drive uh, a decrease in routine task uh, jobs. So that's why I, I, I believe that that's not a big thing for, for the region as you see in other regions. Well, my, my answer is pretty similar because uh, Brazil and, and Argentina are, are it's not similar, but uh, in, in this case, I think the explanation uh, is, is, is pretty the same. The, the, the skill uh, um, in, in, in the, the routinization uh, task, the, 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 high, the higher and the skill are, are very associated. So I think it's because of that we, we don't uh, see that kind of um, movement. Yeah, totally agree. We're not. I mean, Brazil and Argentina are the same. We have five World Cups. You only have two. So yeah. Yes, yes I don't want to say that. <laughs> so thank you very much to all of you, and see you.